Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back once again. As promised, this is our third and final lesson in informal fallacies in this crash course in formal logic. In this lesson, we're going to study fallacies galore, fallacies of presumption, ambiguity, and grammatical analogy. So hold on to your hats, and after this, we'll get on to technical matters in deductive logic. Now, we're going to study first fallacies of presumption. That happens when you presume something that you are supposed to be proving in your conclusion. They include such things as begging the question, complex question, false dichotomy, and suppressed evidence. Now, begging the question is a very popular phrase. Uh, it's actually in the Latin petitio principi, or sometimes called circular reasoning. You talk yourself in a circle. In this way, you create an illusion that you provide a support for a conclusion when really your premises include that conclusion pretty overtly already. So this can happen in one of several ways. Now, the conclusion could be just the same thing as a premise, maybe just restated in different words. When that happens, sometimes people call this strongly begging the question. You said the exact same thing in your conclusion as you did in your premises. So, for example, if we say, we know that mass creates gravity because dense uh, planets have more gravity, well, how do you know which planets are more dense? Dilbert says, they have more gravity. Well... Dogbert says that's circular reasoning, and Dilbert says I prefer to think of it as having no loose ends. This is a case of strongly begging the question. Now, sometimes you have a conclusion that's not the same thing as a premise, but your premises require a perhaps unstated premise, uh, premise that presumes what you're trying to prove. This is sometimes called weakly begging the question, because nobody who was willing to buy into your conclusion would have likely given into your premise whether it was stated or not. So, for example, if somebody says, well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says the Bible is inspired, and consequently we can say that we know that the Bible is inspired. Well, notice the premise is not quite the same thing as the conclusion, but there's an unstated point here. The unstated premise is that all claims in the Bible, including the one mentioned in the premise, are true claims. Now, who would believe that unless they already believed the conclusion at the bottom? That's weakly begging the question. Now, another way the begging of the question can occur is if a person talks themselves into a circle, but a rather large circle. This is harder to spot. Like if an employer says, nice resume, but I need another reference, and the applicant says, well, Jill can do that for me. But how do I know Jill is trustworthy? And the applicant says, well, I can vouch for her. Notice this person has really just used his own trustworthiness to prove his own trustworthiness, just in a not-so-explicit or straightforward way. So if you talk yourself into a circle, even if that circle is rather large, and your premises turn themselves back upon the conclusion and vice versa, you're still begging the question, petitio principi, against a person. Now these cases of begging the question need to be distinguished from cases we're going to examine later. If you're not giving this illusion or fakery of support for your conclusion, there's really no fallacy. Uh, forgive my misspelling here of the term inference, but it's sometimes called an immediate inference, and we'll study this in deductive logic. For example, if somebody says some birds are things that live in Antarctica, well, that just means there's something in this overlapping category between birds and things that live in Antarctica. Something like, uh, well, for visualization's sake, this. So on the green circle, you have things that live in Antarctica. On the red circle, you have birds. And consequently, you can say that some things that live in Antarctica are birds. Now, that move from one claim to the other is pretty much a begging of the question in a sense, but really what we're doing here is just making an immediate inference from one claim to another. And similarly, if somebody says the prize is behind door number one or door number two, and you say, well, that means it's behind, just switch the terms, door number two or door number one, you're not trying to prove anything here. It's just an immediate following or an immediate inference from the claim that you started with. So bear in mind, the difference is, in some cases, people are uh, doing some fakery, giving the illusion of support. If there is no such illusion and you're just pointing out a logical fact that one claim is equivalent to another, you're not really committing a fallacy. Now let's talk about complex questions, sometimes called by Aristotle the mini questions fallacy. That's when a person asks two or more questions as a single one, and the first question presumes the existence of a background condition. By tricking somebody into answering the question, they're trying to trap you into admitting the existence of the background condition that that complex question assumes. The classic case of complex question is a question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Uh, notice, whether or not the guy answers yes or answers no, he'd be admitting to something like, I previously beat my wife. Or how about this question? What if a cop's chasing a guy and says, where did you hide the dope? How do you answer that? Any way that you answer the question, you're admitting that you got dope and you hid it. And here's one of my favorites, uh, how would you like me to kick yours? <laughs> 
if you ever find a good way to answer that question, it kind of presumes that you would like for them to kick yours, right? There are many questions involved in each of these scenarios, and they're asked under the guise of one question. Now, complex questions need to be distinguished from leading questions. That sometimes happens in a courtroom when an attorney, say, is questioning somebody on the stand and tries to give them information or prod them towards a certain answer. Now, that happens when that happens. There are no logical fallacies, but you can say that the person in question is cheating by giving the answerer some information anyways. So leading questions are a distinct topic from complex questions. Moving on. False dichotomy, sometimes called the either-or fallacy or the fallacy of false dilemma, a very popular name for this fallacy, occurs when you give two unlikely alternatives and present them as though they're the only alternatives available. Now, the arguer in that case just eliminates the undesirable alternative, which actually could be either one in this case, and leaves the desirable one as the conclusion. Now, the illusion here is that the alternatives that are under question exhaust all your possibilities so that evidence against one counts for, as evidence for the remaining one. Now, arguing from dilemmas is a pretty common form of uh, reasoning and arguing. If somebody says the prize is behind door number one or door number two, and you know it's not behind door number two, common sense tells you that you should say the prize is probably behind door number one. However, there are cases in which the alternatives given are completely unlikely. Uh, sometimes in political debates, people say you're either for us or against us. Well, wait a minute. What about the alternative of being agnostic or undecided? Or what if somebody says you either believe a certain doctrine or religious point of view and somebody says you either believe it or disbelieve it? Again, this form of dilemma eliminates the possibility that there could be neutrality or skepticism. There's a third option here that's being overlooked. Now, those of you who are in romantic relationships will like this example. Suppose a guy says to his uh, lady friend, if we really loved each other, we'd be sleeping together by now. Well, she might disagree with that. Notice, in this case, if-then sentences show that they are common forms of presenting dilemmas. If this, then that means if not, then no. In other words, if we're not sleeping together, then we don't really love each other. Well, are those the only two options? Maybe she loves him and just wants to wait a while. Now notice, the following are bad dilemmas, for us or against us, for example, or believer or disbeliever. But there are such things as fair dilemmas. What about believer or not? Well, that not a believer canvasses both skepticism and disbelief, belief in the opposite of the claim of the believer. Or you're either for us or against us. That looks like an unfair dilemma, but you're either for us or you're not for us. Well, yeah, those are the only two options available. So watch out for dilemmas, the either-or premises, and see if they really do exhaust all your possibilities. In these cases, we got some pretty fair choices. Now, the fallacy of suppressed evidence, sometimes called the fallacy of special pleading, occurs in inductive arguments when an argument or an arguer ignores evidence that would either lead to a different conclusion or drastically undermine the original inference. And these are special cases that apply to inductive arguments, and I'll explain why. You remember that inductive arguments are cogent only if they're strong and have all true premises. We covered that in an earlier lesson. And we used an example in which a person was deciding whether or not they should go swimming today because it would be fun, and they had lots of evidence that swimming today would be fun, but they overlooked some shark dangers in the water. Now, how to handle this? My two cents and the common view is this. Inductive arguments that violate the principle of total evidence, taking into account all relevant data before drawing the inductive conclusion, count as weak evidence. So, we could have just as well covered suppressed evidence under the uh, fallacies of weak induction, but we're going to cover them here under fallacies of presu uh, presumption. Now, one common way of committing this fallacy is to ignore events or things that have happened over time and just cite events from the dis distant past that support your view. If somebody says no war, however large, has ever destroyed life on Earth, and therefore the next war will not, well, that overlooks the fact that we've developed some incredible weapons of mass destruction since the last major world wars. What about quoting out of context? Taking passages out of context from the Bible or the Constitution are a common way of suppressing the evidence. The evidence that's being suppressed is the context of the quote. Try this for example. You shouldn't have long hair, guys, right? Doesn't the Bible say so? Doesn't the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? 
Well, look at the context of that passage. The context of the passage was whether or not women should pray with their heads unveiled. It was a cultural custom back in the day for women to do that such thing. And Paul said we had no such custom and neither do the churches of God. Now, Matthew Henry, an older commentary on the Bible, said Christian religion sanctioned national customs like women praying a certain way and men having their hair a certain way when they're not against the great principles of truth and holiness. Affected singularities or applications receive no countenance from the Bible. And I think Matthew Henry's right here. Ask yourselves, people, if people are uh, in certain conservative churches are so uptight about men having long hair, why aren't they equally uptight about women praying with their heads uncovered? If you want to see people quoting out of context, go to movie reviews. Boy, that's an incredible place to find this sort of fallacy. There's a blurb that said hysterical and entertaining about Bruce Willis's latest Die Hard movie. Actually, in the context, it says the action is fast-paced, hysterically overproduced, and surprisingly entertaining, about as realistic as a Roadrunner cartoon. Notice how you take a little bit out of context, suppress the evidence of context in this case, and you get an entirely different blurb, in this case, conclusion. Now, fallacies of ambiguity occur when there's some sort of ambiguity, and that means multiple legitimate meanings in the premises or conclusions. Uh, these uh, cover fallacies of equivocation and amphiboly. For example, boy, Louie, everything that's bad for you is good, and everything that's good for you is bad. Uh, it looks like good and bad are being swapped out for their meanings. Diets are hard, he goes on to say, and Louis, I think, is justifiably confused when he says, wait, I'm trying to follow your logic. Does that mean that easy and hard are equivalent as well? Again, uh, an ambiguity was introduced into this uh, conversation. Now, there's lots of terms that can take on multiple meanings, such as bats or batter, or how about if you find out that your grandparents are rockin', wouldn't that uh, give you a little bit of a surprise? By now, you're probably figuring out that there are a lot of jokes that turn upon ambiguity, specifically ambiguities in a single word or phrase. Those are called equivocations, like the old joke about the Buddhist who said to the hot dog vendor, make me one with everything. Do you mean one as in numerically uh, one and the same as, or do you mean one of them hot dogs? Or try this corny joke, what do you get when you cross a river with a canoe? You get to the other side. Notice the word being equivocated on here is the word cross. It could mean either mix together or it could mean go from one point to another. So obviously there's going to be a lot of jokes that you're just not going to get like the peasants are revolting. Uh, do you mean rebelling or you mean they're disgusting? You're not going to get the joke if you don't catch the equivocation. I'd like nothing better than your pecan pie, Loretta, so I'll have nothing. Or try this joke on for size. I love this movie. It has a twist at the end. A twist as in an alternative ending or unexpected ending or grimy. Every chubby checker movie has a twist at the end. Twist as in dance. But there are such things as fallacies of equivocation, and that happens when the equivocation occurs within the context of an argument. Like we said previously, a chess player is a person and a bad chess player is a bad person. Well, we noted in a previous lesson that bad can be mean without moral character, or it can mean lacking competence in a certain field or sport like chess. So, in this case, we have an argument that turns on an equivocation, and in this case, it is a fallacy of equivocation. The Christian philosopher Norman Geisler, in his book uh, Come Let Us Reason, gives a good example of this. Uh, he's not very happy with bad arguments, even when they're offered on behalf of his own religious views. So, for example, if somebody were to say, people believe in the miracles of science, so why on earth don't they go on to believe the miracles of the Bible? Wait a minute, there's an argument here, but it turns on an equivocation. Miracle can mean a supernatural event, or it can mean something that's just astounding. So the Bible talks about things that seem to be, in some sense, supernatural. Science talks about miracles loosely that it performs, just meanings it's amazing what we can pull off with science. Now, whenever you think an equivocation is present, you should be able to spot the term that's being equivocated upon and tell the arguer the two distinct senses in which they are using the term and equivocating. But if you think there's an ambiguity in an argument and you can't locate it in a single word, maybe the arguer misinterpreted an ambiguity due to sentence structure as a whole. Now, that often happens due to grammar or poor punctuation. And if you have a contract, be sure and read every sentence carefully because some sentences in the contract may take on multiple meanings if it isn't worded very precisely. And again, amphibolies can be a good source of humor. Try this example. While writing to Gettysburg on a scrap of brown paper, Lincoln wrote his most famous speech. Think you know what that means? I'll guarantee you, you probably don't think that Lincoln was writing on a scrap of brown paper, but the sentence structure is ambiguous enough to give it a second meaning. 
Another example that I got from Merrily Salmon's book, Introduction to Logic and Critical Thinking, involves the 1800s, uh, or rather 18th century evangelist John Wesley, who wrote in his journal that he knelt whilst meditating upon the 23rd Psalm. Did he kneel on the 23rd Psalm? Seems a little impious, doesn't it? Notice the sentence structure is ambiguous. Now, this one you're going to have to think about a little bit. The guards and prisoners who refused to join in the prison break were tied up and left behind. Now, look for an amphibole here. What is the sentence saying? Were there guards who refused to join in the prison break, as opposed to guards who did join in the prison break? Well, obviously, the guards are one group of people, and prisoners who refuse to join in the prison break are a second. But those who refuse to join in the prison break, uh, that phrase could modify or describe guards or prisoners uh, for all that this sentence structure tells you. Now consider this example from Marilyn Voss Savant, widely considered the smartest woman around due to her high IQ score. The anthropologist went to a remote area and took photographs of some native women, but they weren't developed. Well, wait a minute. What wasn't developed? The photographs or the native women? Are we just talking about a primitive tribe here? Again, the sentence structure is uh, pretty ambiguous. Now, ambiguity is not the same thing as vagueness. I'll just point that out immediately. Ambiguities occur when you have two crystal clear, distinct meanings of terms or sentences that are being used in arguments or in conversations. Vagueness occurs when you have just one imprecise or unclear meaning. Now, when terms are imprecise or unclear, a fallacy is not being committed, although there are sometimes problems of vagueness that are uh, very similar to problems of ambiguity. Now, vagueness can create problems such as cliché mongering and weasel wording. That happens when a person starts talking and they have the impression that they're giving you information, but really they're not saying anything specific at all. Calvin gets a little mileage out of this. I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, uh, your writing can be intimidating and an impenetrable fog. His report is The Dynamics of Inner Being and Monological Imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study in psychic transrelational gender modes. Uh, academia is not fit for Calvin. We want to avoid such imprecision in our talk generally, uh, or elsewise we're going to get just a bunch of talk that's not worth having. Now let's move on to our last batch of fallacies, fallacies of grammatical analogy, called fallacies of grammatical analogy because the arguments bear a grammatical or structural similarity and are sometimes confused thus for good arguments. Uh, basically, the fallacies of grammatical analogy, just like the last uh, category, fallacies of ambiguity, really just have two major subdivisions in them. In this case, fallacies of grammatical analogy uh, consist of mainly fallacies of composition and division, which are very nearly the same fallacy. Now, in a previous lesson, we used the example of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge being made of atoms and atoms being invisible. Does that follow that the Brooklyn Bridge is invisible? Or did we illicitly move from a property of the parts, atoms, to a property of the whole? Now, you can see why this is called a fallacy of grammatical analogy. Sometimes you are legitimately permitted to move from properties or features of the parts to properties of the whole. Just when you're able to do that is, uh, well, it's not an easy matter to nail down. So in fallacies division, you divide property of the whole and divide it down to the parts. In a fallacy of composition, you illegitimately go from features of the parts to features of the whole. For example, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge example is one uh, fallacy of composition. Or if a person said each element in the recipe I'm making is delicious, therefore the dish as a whole will be delicious. They're running a risk of the fallacy of composition. But did they really commit that fallacy? In general, how can you tell an erroneous from a legitimate transferences of properties from parts to whole or vice versa? I'm afraid there are no easy answers here. Uh, if you're looking at an argument and you see a division or a combination of properties from parts to whole or vice versa, you're going to have to use your background knowledge to figure out whether it was a legitimate tactic. And generally, you have the background knowledge that you need to do that. For example, if somebody says each brick in the wall is over 12 ounces, can't you just move to the conclusion that the wall is going to be over 12 ounces? Yes, over 12 ounces is going to distribute really easily. Whether, and if each brick in the wall is under 12 pounds, under 12 pounds is a property that is not going to distribute in that case. Or how about this, if the wall is over one foot tall? Well, does it follow that each brick in the wall is over one foot tall? That property does not distribute. But if the wall is physical, the property of physicality probably does distribute. 
What if you find out that the campus population is 50% female? Does 50% female distribute down to each member of the campus population? I'm joking, of course. This 50% uh, femaleness is a property that does not thus distribute. Now, here's a joke for you. Does reasonableness distribute? Or, well, suppose there's a church that makes the following plan. We're going to build a new church. That seems reasonable. We'll build it on the site of the old church. Reasonable. Materials from the old church will be used to build the new one. Very reasonable. And we will continue to use the old church until the new one is built. Independently considered, number four is reasonable. All combined, reasonable di reasonableness did not uh, combine very well. Basically, if you put all these together and think that the whole plan is reasonable, you're committing a composition fallacy. And consider an all-star team. If each member of the team is a great player, will the team be a great team? Well, not necessarily. You run the risk of uh, committing a fallacy of com uh, composition here. And the same thing goes if you have a great team and you automatically assume that each member is a great player. That runs the risk of a fallacy of division. Now, a little bit of help in discerning uh, these sorts of fallacies, you need to know the difference between talking about a class as a whole, like when somebody says fleas are numerous, and talking about them distributively. Uh, fleas are small. Well, that's talking about fleas, each member of the class. Or in the case of whales, uh, you could say, for example, that whales are endangered. It doesn't mean that each and every member of that class is endangered. It's just a statement about the class as a whole. Whales are mammals, however. Well, uh, the class of whales is probably not a mammal, but each individual whale is definitely a mammal. So that's a case of distributive reference. Well, I don't mean to burden you with that last example. Just memorize your composition and division fallacies and the other fallacies in this lesson. And we'll see you next time for our lessons in deductive logic. Thanks for hanging around. Bye-bye.